Hello and welcome to Author Showcase. My guest today is uh, Mike Corcoran and Mike is the co-author of a new book called uh, Hollywood on Lake Michigan. And the book, as far as I know, is about um, Hollywood as, I'm sorry, Chicago as a movie producing capital. And Mike's going to tell us a little bit about how Chicago came to be a movie capital and uh, how it's progressing on into the future. So, Mike, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. On Author Showcase here at My the pleasure. Roots Room. And tell me a little bit, how did this, tell me a little bit about yourself. First of all, I know that we were just talking a little while ago and you were telling me that you are a um, tour guide here in Chicago, mm -hmm. among other things. So tell me a little bit about your, your background. Sure. I um, uh, started out when I was young. I was an actor and uh, did a lot of things. I was a stand-up comic for many years during the boom years. That's how I came to this wicked city. Moved here in uh, 1987, you know, on the strength of three months' worth of stand-up bookings, you know, one of those yeah. crazy things of youth. And I've lived here for, uh, you know, about 30 years now almost. And uh, I... Uh, once the comedy boom sort of crested and crashed, I realized that if I was going to continue doing stand-up full-time, I was either going to have to move to New York or L.A. And at that point, it was about 1994, I realized that I loved living in Chicago. Who doesn't love living uh, yeah, in Chicago? Yeah, a lot more than I liked being a comic anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of burnt out on that. So I uh, sort of changed things up. I went back to school and sort of, uh, you know... I, what I call myself is I'm a creative hunter-gatherer. Um, I, uh, I still do stand-up once in a while. I, uh, I do tours, uh, tours of Chicago. I do lectures about Chicago history. Um, right. You know, try to just get together about 10 of those things that they tell you you can't make a living at. Exactly, know? yeah, and, and try to string it together into some kind of a living. <laughs> so besides the Hollywood tours, then do you give other tours of the city as well? I have a whole bunch of uh, different specialty tours, uh, architecture tour, uh, you know, I have um, history tours, um, certain ones. I have, uh, you know, a tragic Chicago tour, go to places where all tragic things happen. I have a unionist and anarchist tour. Oh, that you know, sounds like fun. Around, you yeah. know. It's uh -huh. one of those things where it's the same downtown no matter what. And it's just sort of, you know, what what, uh, exactly, yeah. what sort of prism you want to look at. Right. You know, cause and I, you said you do some Columbian Exposition stuff I have well. a I have a Columbian Exposition tour, and I have a five-part lecture series about the Columbian Exposition. Yeah. I'm a serious uh, freak about that. Exactly. And as I said, as a, as a South Sider growing up is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart as well, living in Hyde Park and South Shore. And also you might be interested, I actually grew up in Pullman. I lived in Pullman oh. until I was uh, in sixth grade. My dad grew up in Pullman his whole life and my mm -hmm grandfather worked for Pullman so another sort oh, of interesting fair. area that's quite a bit in the news today as it's you great. all know it's and great. so anytime you want to go out and do a Pullman tour together I'll be happy to, to come I would out love and talk that I just... spent I've actually volunteered down there quite uh, a bit I yeah. was part of a group of people who uh, went into the Acme Coke plant at 111th and Torrance and we uh, on the on the under the auspices of uh, the Chicago um, Heritage Project, Industrial Heritage Project, sure. we went in there and we just spent a summer going in and uh, going through all 30 of those buildings and taking it's out amazing. everything that wasn't nailed down now, and a lot of stuff that was. We have to explain for those people who don't know that uh, Coke plant on the south side yeah. neither is white uh, no, white powder white gold. and neither is it neither is it a the, drink. The high fructose <laughs> beverage, neither is it's uh, yeah it's a uh, purified coal for use in steel. Yeah, yeah very cool. So the it. next time we get together, we're going to have to stop and talk about that some more. Maybe we'll be uh, do another show about Pullman and the South Side. But today, we're here to talk about uh, Hollywood on Lake Michigan. And um, because of this book, I'm guessing, is why you're known on light, online as Hollywood Mike. Is that right? Yeah, Michael Hollywood is my Facebook name, just as a way to sort of uh, say screw you to Facebook and, uh, you know, to be uh, different and Sure. Okay. Great. So people can find you on Facebook as uh, Michael Hollywood. I'm Michael Hollywood. Yeah, on okay. Facebook. And great. 
great. So tell me, how did you get started talking about this particular topic? Why is it of interest to you? And then we'll talk a little bit about the history itself. Certainly. Uh, well, the first edition of Hollywood on Lake Michigan was written by Arnie Bernstein in 1998. And Arnie is your co-author. Yeah, he's my co-author. Right. Uh, basically, uh, I when I started doing tours in um, about 2002, I had a specialty tour that was, I called it my cinematic Chicago tour. And uh, it was about Chicago and the movies and going around looking at places where movies were shot. And about 75% of it was cribbed off of Arnie's book, uh, Hollywood on Lake Michigan. And one day I was walking around Lincoln Square and uh, this is when uh, the original publisher of the book, Lake Claremont Press, still had their offices in Lincoln Square. Okay. And Great. so one day I'm just sort of walking through my hood and I see this this office and there's all these guidebooks that I use to do all my uh, all my tours and especially Hollywood on Lake Michigan. Okay. And I sort of put two and two together and I went in and I'm like, oh my God, you guys are great. You know, I love your books. And met uh, Sharon Woodhouse, the uh, publisher. Sure. And, Sharon's uh, a very nice uh, woman. And we've had a number of uh, Claremont Press uh, authors on Author Showcase over the years. Oh, I can years, imagine. So. It's great. bread yeah. and butter for uh, Chicago lovers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, that sort of started a, a relationship with her and I got the guide guild that I belong to to come to their offices and have an event. And it also started sort of a, 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 a campaign of bothering her to bother Arnie Bernstein to do an update because I love this book and I love the tour. You know, I love the tour that I do. I want to I wanted to have him do an update. So year after year, I'd be, every time I saw her, I'm like, you know, make Arnie do an update. And I met Arnie at one of their events and I was like, man, I love this book. Do an update. Do an update. And. So, and he said, why don't you do it? No, at that point, he, he just said, I'm not into it. I'm not into it. Yeah. But uh, a couple of years later, um, I had been to a Lake Claremont event. It was the uh, it was the release party for the uh, Guide to Chicago Blues. And it was at um, it was at Buddy Guy's. And I had uh, had a blues, a blues, a, a snoot full of blues beer. You know, I was in a in a good blues mood. And she was giving me a ride back for, to the from the downtown up to the north side. And she started talking about how, you know, we really do want to do an update of this book. But Arnie has two other projects he's working on. And so would you do it? Yeah, and so that's how it came to yeah, be. Yeah, it came to be. I was like, oh, sure, yeah, I'll write a book. You know, and then I, they kind of, yeah, right. they thought right. about it m right. a little bit. And so, more. was this your first book? Is yeah, your first and only book at this point? Yep, first okay. and only book Great. at this Fantastic. point. Great, I mean, fantastic. Well, let's get into the meat of this in just a second. But you know what I want to do is I want to take a second because we're here to showcase authors. And so I want to take a second and show our viewers maybe um, a quick uh, book trailer of one of our other authors just for a second. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, your book sponsors. some more. Okay, sure. That'd great. Be great, fantastic. Millions of dollars are missing. Several partners are dead, and one man is determined to solve the mystery and save his company. But who can he trust? The world of high finance is a jungle where the naive will be eaten alive. The tipping point is a story of greed, complicity, fraud, then ultimately resurrection and restoration. From the slopes of a luxury ski resort to corporate boardrooms, the story turns even more deadly in a steamy Caribbean hotel suite sending everyone involved scrambling for a safe haven. A culture of corporate cannibals has the remaining partners running for their lives, while the SEC and FBI try to piece together the facts of a conspiracy far bigger than anyone could have imagined. Full of action, adventure, romance, and intrigue, assassination, suicide, and financial ruin are the tipping point. Author Walter Danley draws on his observations as a commercial real estate investor, plus a vivid imagination to craft the characters and environment you will experience in The Tipping Point. Order your copy today at Amazon.com. Okay, so we're here back with Mike Corcoran talking about his book, Hollywood on Lake Michigan. And you're watching Author Showcase, and my name is Reno Lovison, and I'm the executive producer. And today we're here with Mike talking about Hollywood on Lake Michigan. And Mike, tell me, uh, let's get into a little bit more about the guts, actually, of this book. Certainly. So tell me a little bit about... Um, I think some of us who've lived in the city are familiar with the fact that SNA Studios up on in mm -hmm. uh, Uptown yeah, right was up the Broadway. sort of the beginning 
era, uh, era of silent film was right here in Chicago. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? About that? Sure. Uh, actually, the first studio in Chicago was Selig Polyscope Studio, and uh, that was at the corner of. Um, Western and Irving Park in that area. He had a studio there. That started up in about 1897. Wow. Yeah, he was right there. He had seen uh, kinetoscopes, Edison's kinetoscope right away. And that that was the first uh, movie. You know, you looked through the top and it would show, you know, a loop, a 50-foot loop of film. Okay. So he saw that and he liked that, but he knew that the real money was going to be in projecting it on a wall and having people come into a room and, you know, having them sit there and stuff. So he looked at the, he was trying to find the best design for a camera and the projection camera. And he saw that the Lumiere brothers in France had the best design. So he wanted to uh, basically steal their design. So he went to this machinist in Chicago with the, you know, with the uh, intent to have him uh, reverse engineer that. And he went into this meeting with the guy and he looked around this guy's office and he saw these blueprints on the wall. And after a couple of minutes, he realized that this, these were the schematics already for the Lumiere brothers design. Really? So it turned out that this guy had a mysterious French client who was having him make these parts one at a time. Yeah. And so... They sort of had this moment of uh, larcenous serendipity where they agreed to start putting out, uh, you know, cameras. So they started putting out the Selig Polyscope, and he, he started that studio um, up in the St. Ben's area. Uh, they had, um, you know, a lot of westerns, and uh, he had a tribe of Native Americans come over from Michigan, and they set up their teepees, and it was housing for the actors and a set, and uh, wow. did all sorts. So it of stuff. started with the technology, yes. building the technology here. Started there, and then in 1907, uh, his biggest star was a man named Bronco Billy William Anderson, and he wanted to go and start his own movie studio. So he and George Spohr got together and started S and A Studios, the okay. S and the A. Okay. And that started up in Uptown. That's so we know it's E S S N A Y, right? But yeah, it really was S and A and that was for Spore and yeah. what was the other guy's name? Anderson. Anderson. Okay. Pretty funny. So that's pretty good. And of course their big star was Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin, at least that's for the one reason movie, why right? most people know about I mean he did several movies for Celic or uh, for S and A, but he only did his first movie for them here in Chicago. It was uh, Charlie Chaplin's very first movie? No, it was he had already he was already the biggest star oh, okay. on earth. He had uh, gotten he, his European uh, contract was up and Anderson lured him away. So uh, so they got Charlie Chaplin here and he did a movie for them. Yeah, that was the thing. It was a, it was he played a janitor in a in incompetent in an incompetent movie studio. So. Oh, okay. They didn't have to go far for uh, <laughs> for a storyline obviously, huh? So All right, well, um so, you know, I think that's fun to think about. Everybody loves to hear about those old uh, days, silent days of the movies here in Chicago. But your real expertise, uh, the, what you bring to this book, I understand, is really modern day movies and well, what's going on yeah. since uh, since those early days. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, what I call the contemporary era of Chicago production, because there was these, these first studios and Chicago had all, um, there was a period in the uh, early 1910s where one out of every five films in the world was made in Chicago. And wow. then by the early 20s, uh, all the studios... That's roughly 20%, isn't it? Yeah, something one out like of five, that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> it's one out of five sounds better than 20%. Okay. Yeah, there you go. One out of every five. You know? <laughs> it's like that fifth dentist. Right. Um, so, uh, let's see. So, yeah. So, by the early 20s, they'd all moved uh, to, you know... Uh, Studios Beautiful, out in California, warm LA, and then there the was sun shining all day, all day long, yeah, all yeah. day long. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, let's see. So there was a long period where there weren't a lot of movies made in Chicago. Sure. There used to be a sort of there's sort of a myth that the first Mayor Daly didn't like. I was just like going to say that. Is that not? A, I was going to say, isn't that because the first Mayor Daly didn't really like? Uh... The, the story goes, the legend goes that he was watching some television show and a Chicago cop took a bribe on it, and he uh, was so incensed yeah. and horrified at this aspersion on his beautiful city that he said, "Never ever have." But that's it's not really true. I mean, he wasn't thrilled about movie production, and not a lot of stuff got shot here during that period, but. There were there was a you know sort of a rudimentary film office and there were things that got yeah. you know that got made during that period. This is the uh, introduction. 
Legend has it that early in his reign as mayor, Richard J. Daly saw a television show that had a scene in which a Chicago cop accepted a bribe. He was so enraged by this insult to his beloved city that he forbade all movie and television productions from shooting in Chicago. Whether or not that's the actual reason, only a scant few film crews were allowed to shoot here during his administration. It was not until after Daly's death in 1976 that the Hollywood studios were finally allowed back to the city that gave birth to them. And what could be characterized as the contemporary era of Chicago feature film production began in earnest. Many would mourn the lost decades in which Chicago's visual riches, visual riches were left unseen by the film-going world, but it allowed the city to evolve without the intrusive gaze of the camera's eye. Chicagoans, already an unself-conscious lot, were able to construct their own reality, fashioning a narrative far deeper than could be written on a studio back lot. Chicago has always been a place where anyone can come and try to live their dreams, where you can start from scratch and reinvent yourself, again and again if you wish, where you can live the life you want, not the life you're born into, where you can write your own story, where you can do whatever the hell you want as long as you don't bother anybody else. Without the pressures of conformity found elsewhere, artists, writers, actors, architects, musicians, philosophers, scientists, and chefs develop new methods and styles, fusing disparate elements together, building upon traditions while simultaneously ignoring them. The Chicago School of Architecture shares this bond with the Chicago School of Sociology, as does the Chicago blues with the Chicago style of acting, house music with improvisation, and the gyro with Chicago style pizza. What is Chicago other than an immense film set built on stilts of concrete hovering above a swamp, a patchwork constructed of dreams from across the globe, a set for the greatest movie ever made, the story of Chicago. And Chicago was ready for its close-up. Well, the, the, the Sting shot a little bit oh, the here, sting, yeah. but the thing that really blew the roof off was the Blues Brothers. Oh, really? In so, 1980. So that was before. I thought Bullet was first. But Blues Brothers was well, first. I think you're thinking of. Are you thinking of the Hunter? That Steve McQueen movie. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, that was about 1981, 1980, okay. 81. Okay. It was his last right. movie. But that's why we have a professional here to talk about movies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking Bullet. No. Yeah, yeah. Oops, sorry about that. It folks. was a great chase right. scene. Yeah. But, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, but you know, that's the one that really. I mean, the okay. Blues Brothers was a hit. It, Chicago looked beautiful. There was all that great music, Absolutely. and that really sort of started started the ball rolling. Okay. Um, I have to tell you, I have a very small part in that Blues Brothers movie. Really? Very, very small part. Uh, I used to be a window decorator back in those days, and I decorated men's uh, menswear stores downtown uh, on State Street and on Van Buren Street. And one of my windows is in that uh, is on Van Buren Street when they're like going under the L. You know, yeah. driving by, and I see it, and I think, "Oh, I put that shirt." What's it look like? I, I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll point that, it it's out to you all sometime. the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. Yeah. But John Hughes and all his iconic teen comedies, and I mean, Hollywood wanted him to shoot those out in Hollywood, and he was adamant. He said, "No, I'm shooting them here in in Chicago, in the northern suburbs." And he had a little studio in Niles, and I think a lot of people owe a, a great debt of gratitude to him because. His, he helped really, you know, start the ball rolling as well and uh, created the infrastructure for Chicago's film. Yeah. And then through the 80s, there, it just sort of kept snowballing. Uh, there were the action movies. Everybody had a, you know, Arnold had an action movie. Chuck Norris had that great coat of silence with the, uh, the great scene where they're on top of the train car and they go over the Well Street Bridge and the bad guy jumps in the river. Uh, there was a Steven Seagal. They were all, they were all, they were all not good movies, but 
Chicago was in them and looked really good. Yeah, Chicago looks good on film. Do you agree that when you see Chicago on a film, you can like just immediately know? Is there something about the brick in the buildings that it's just immediately you know that it's Chicago? And there is, I, I think. Yeah. I think, yeah. and, and you can also know when it's really Winnipeg. Yeah, or, yeah, Toronto, <laughs> or Toronto. somewhere like that. Or of yeah. course, Blues Brothers, uh, the Milwaukee. You know when they use yeah, the bridge, the bridge, the bridge to, to, nowhere. to nowhere. Yeah, it's, and then uh, they just drop the car from a helicopter yeah. next to the Hancock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I lived in Milwaukee around that time for about two years, and so it was kind of fun to see that anyway. But uh, so, what is your some of your favorite movies in Chicago? What do you think is uh, or how about what movie really showcases the city or uses the city in the best light? Do you, do you have an opinion well, about that? Well, there's sort of an algorithm I have about movies shot in Chicago. One of them is how good, is, you know, how much is Chicago used, how good of a movie is it, mm -hmm. you know, and how do Chicagoans, how are Chicagoans portrayed? Uh, so there's a lot of movies that score high on the use, use of Chicago and then just aren't a really good movie, but... There's some the certain ones. Well, I'd say the classic uh, everybody knows about is The Fugitive. Okay. You know Harrison oh, yeah. Ford, Tommy Lee Jones. Good. Going back to Pullman again. Yeah, great. A lot of <laughs> good use, use of Pullman. Pullman there. Yeah. A lot of use of Pullman there, yeah. and um, you know they used, the, and and it's a pretty good movie. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah, it it's was. A, it's a it, great it was. Movie. It was a good movie, and uh, you're right. It used the city well. Um. But there are so many. I mean, I saw so many movies. Uh, so many bad movies that I, mm -hmm. I don't even talk about. Just well, because. that's the that's the thing I think about is that, uh, especially during that growing period, there were a lot of bad movies shot in Chicago. A lot of Chicago, a lot of movies none of us saw, even that were interested to see Chicago in the movies. What and I used to kind of ponder that, and it's like, why were so many bad movies shot in Chicago? And then I realized. There's a lot of the bad movies shot made. everywhere. I mean, yeah, exactly, most, four yeah. out of every five movies <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> aren't yeah. very good, you know. <laughs> So there yeah. was that. But, you know, there are a lot of, um, I'm trying to think. In recent times, uh, a really good drama, or it's sort of, actually sort of a comedy, uh, Stranger Than Fiction. Okay. I sort of like that movie. Uh, it was trying to shoot for a Hal Ashby comedies of the 70s sort of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, has a great cast. Uh, so, and a lot of people freak out when they hear Will Ferrell, but it wasn't one of those wacky guy in the 70s kind of comedies. It's it's very understated performance, and uh, he plays a man who hears a voice in his head that's narrating his life, and he tries to find out what's going on with the voice, and he actually goes to a an English professor, Dustin Hoffman, who tells him, you know, tries to find out what's going on, and he says, well, if you are in a story, you, you should, you know, you should live it as best you can. And there's a parallel plot where Emma Thompson plays an author who's trying to figure out how to kill off her main character, whose name is Harold Crick. And it's sort of a it's sort of a magical realism sort of thing where those two plot lines sort of come together. Just a nice little piece of work. That sounds like a fun uh, rental movie. Tell, tell us the name one more time. Stranger Than Fiction. Stranger Than Fiction, shot in Chicago with uh, Will Ferrell and Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson, Dustin Hoffman, Queen Latifah. Great little so here's the thing. We haven't even touched the surface of this book yet. <laughs> and uh, there's so much to talk about. But I think uh, the idea that we've got a little taste of this, um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, encourage people. Let, let's talk just for a second. What I'd like to do is ask you real quickly about some of the people who helped shape this um, modern film in Chicago because I think Second City had a lot to do with that and the people who came from Saturday Night Live um, I remember leafing through the book here and seeing Harold Ramis who went Harold? to Sen High School mm -hmm. not too far from where we are here at the Roots Room today yeah. and so uh, why don't we talk just for a real quick second about some of the people that we'll encounter in this book and how they helped to build the film industry in Chicago Sure, uh, Harold Ramis was a great guy, he uh interviewed Arnie interviewed him for the original version and even though he was spending 12 hours a day cutting uh, year one he still gave me a 25 minute interview over the phone talked about a lot of interesting stuff he talked about how Groundhog Day and uh, some other movies he's made have made him a darling of the psychiatric industry interesting he says about he's heard about how some psychiatrists make their patients watch Groundhog Day as part of their therapy and He's also he's done that. He's done the analyze this and analyze that movies, and Stuart saves his family, you know, for Al Franken. Yeah. And um, 
you know, he's act, he was actually on the board of the U.S. Uh, the Psychiatric Association and had spoken at many conferences and stuff. There's a, you know, he talked about the serious dialogue about how Groundhog Day in his films. It's very, interesting. It's very interesting stuff. Uh, talked to a man named Nathan Crowley, who's a production designer, pretty much responsible for all the entire look of a movie. He's from England, but he spent five years in Chicago because he did four movies in a row here. Wow. Uh, Batman Begins, The Lake House, The Dark Knight, and Public Enemies. And he talked a lot about Chicago and how much he loved Chicago architecture and stuff like that. And there's all sorts of... Um, um, Bob Title, uh, producer, he and uh, his partner George Tillman, they're, uh, Bob's a producer, George is a director, they did a Soul Food, the Barbershop movies. Barbershop was great, South Shore. Yeah. That's yeah. where I lived later, 79th Street. I know that yeah, uh, barbershop so. location very well. So yeah. uh, anyway, I would love to keep talking about this. I wish we could do an hour-long show. I think what we'll have to do is have you come back again, and we'll talk a little bit more yeah. about it. Sorry. But in the meantime, let's uh, encourage everyone who's watching here today to go out and pick up a copy of Hollywood on Lake Michigan. Second uh, edition. Second edition with uh, our guest, Michael Corcoran as the author, co-author, along with Arnie Bernstein. It is available through Chicago Review Press. It's available at Amazon, I'm sure. Oh, everywhere. And all Even of your favorite iTunes, bookstores. Yeah, everywhere. Yep, yep. But we buy can... it at an independent bookstore. Yeah, Support Sand Myers. Go down, yeah. see them downtown. Mm -hmm. See uh, Women and Children First. Uh, yeah. There's a number of good bookstores. Bookseller in Lincoln Bookseller Square. Bookseller in Lincoln Square, sure. of course. So uh, go out and tell them you saw us on Bookies Author Showcase. down in uh, Beverly, too. Exactly. They were really yeah. nice to me, so I should put yeah. a plug so in. So there's plenty of good. Forget about Amazon. <laughs> go to your local bookseller. That's right. That's right. Tell them you saw us on Author Showcase. Reno and Mike. Michael uh, Hollywood, talking about Hollywood on Lake Michigan. So, uh, Michael, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, for our viewers, uh, tune in and see us on Authors Showcase as often as you can. You can see us on uh, YouTube and at AuthorsBroadcast.com. So, uh, again, Michael, thanks so much for being here, Hollywood on Lake Michigan, and um, keep reading. My pleasure. Wow, this awesome feel-good book reveals why cool super chefs and health nut docs are dishing about the extraordinary powers of olive oil, nature's liquid gold. Savor deliciously healing surprises. New research deserves high fives because olive oil, a key ingredient in the Mediterranean diet, and other healing oils are making a big splash around the globe. Oil superpowers can lower the risk of facing a bad ticker, the big C, and even stall father time. Bring on the butter. When paired with oils, this 20th century forbidden fat is a new 21st century health food. Combining olive oil with other oils can help combat fatigue, fight fat, and help you morph into a lean, energized, super humanoid at any age. In the healing powers of olive oil, you'll discover unusual home cures and scrumptious, yummy, fresh ingredient recipes. Pick up your favorite bottle of EVO and experience the delicious healing powers of olive oil today. Olive oil. Bon appetit.